every Sabbath, every day, bringing all we have, all we are, to the feet of Jesus. Amen. Yeah. I'd like to thank Bonnie Sharp. Can everybody say hi, Bonnie? I'd like to thank Brian Hawthorne. Everybody say hi, Brian. Bob Booyah. Could we say hi, Bob? And we all say hello to you, of course. I uh, have the privilege of traveling, traveling with these fine individuals uh, many, many Sabbaths. And uh, they just love to give God glory and lift, him, lift, his, uh, lift our hearts to His heart. Amen. And so it's a privilege to be here. Pastor, thank you for the opportunity to come. And I bring greetings from the Ontario Conference office. You know, every single morning at 7.30 in the morning, the first thing we do before everything else, we pray. We have worship together and we lift up you. We lift up the churches in the Ontario Conference. We lift them up and we, um, we uh, lift you up before the Lord and, and pray that God will bless you through the week, that God will provide for you whatever you might need. So I, I hope you're excited today. Are you excited to be in the house of God? I, I hope you've come expecting great things, not because I'm here, because that's, that's not, not going to do much, but because God is here with us. Amen. And when God's people gather, when there's something about when we don't forsake the gathering of the people, when we gather together in His name, something exciting happens. And I hope you come expecting that. I really hope you do. So Father, again, this is, this is your time, God. We have come to you. We have, we have given uh, songs to you, our hearts to you. We've heard, we responded back to you. We've heard your word. We've sung back to you. And now, God, we open your word and ask you to speak to us today. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, I'd like to tell you, just, we're going to spend some time together. Pastor said I have till 3.30. Is that right? Did I get that wrong on the email? I'm so sorry. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Um, but, you know, I, I, I just want to open God's word, see where it takes us. Amen. I, I had an interesting experience. I just, um, I don't know, if, is that our system making a little bit of a hum? Or is that, let me just, everything's off? Okay. Um, I, I had an interesting experience. I just finished... Uh, school at Canadian University College at the time it was called, now Berman, um, finished school and came to my first district in Niagara Falls and St. Catharines. Um, had a great time there. Now you'll remember, I, I was here just a few years ago, it seemed like yesterday, amen? I can't remember how long ago it was, but it was a little while back, wasn't it? Um, I looked a lot uh, younger then, didn't I? Don't say amen. <laughs> That was a test. Um, but I, I, my first district was at the Niagara Falls St. Catharines Church. And I'll never forget um, leaving seminary and, and just going, uh, not seminary rather, at CUC having received a Bachelor of Arts degree in religion. And I learned a lot. I have to say I learned a lot. Did I learn everything? No. For those of you who have had the privilege of going to university or college, any school for that matter, do you learn everything in school? No. But you learn a lot. You learn how to learn, right? That's kind of what the idea is. And so I was given this gracious church, two gracious church families, um, brand new as a, as a young fella coming out of school to be their pastor. What a humbling experience that was. Well, I'll never forget, there was a gentleman there by the name of Mike. Mike was a wonderful elder in the church. He uh, had a heart for God like none other I've seen, an incredible heart for God. A and he had a gift. Mike had a gift when he would take, when he would have a room full of people around him, he, would, he had a gift of bringing them together. Do you ever meet anybody like that? They, 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 would, they would say, you know, what's your name? Sally. What's your name? Sue. And it would be, Sally, have you met Sue? And before long, the two were talking. You ever met somebody like that? They just had a gift of bringing people together. And Mike had this gift. And so one day, Mike, he, he called me. He said, Pastor Dave, um, I'm wondering if you're doing anything on Thursday morning. Now, I didn't have any particular plans that, that week, so I said, certainly, Mike, let's go. What do you have, what do you, what do you have in mind? And he said, I'll, I'll tell you along the way. I'll tell you when I get there. So, Mike, Thursday morning, sure enough, early in the morning, Mike rolled into my driveway with this big, long Mercury marquee. Remember those cars? Big, 18-foot car. It was just a long car, barely fit in my driveway. And, and he pulls into the driveway early in the morning, knocks on my door. There's Brother Mike. I said, well, Brother Mike, what, what, what are we doing today? He said, don't worry, you'll, you'll see. You'll, uh, you'll, you'll, you'll see when we get there. So, so sure enough, I, I get into that Mercury Marquee, and it, it pulls out of my driveway, and then down the street. You know, we felt, I felt like a, I don't know, a man's man in that, kind of, in that kind of a car. You know, this long car, and, and just, wow, it was just a great experience, and it rolled just like floating on air. And then he took me to Niagara Falls. How many of you have ever been to Niagara Falls? I hope every hand goes up. <laughs> if you haven't, you need to go. 
Um, and so he took me to Niagara Falls and he drove me to an empty parking lot. And I thought, well, that's interesting. Why in the world would Mike take me to an empty parking lot? Um, early in the morning, on a Thursday morning, Mike took me to an empty parking lot. And before, I, I, I finally said, Mike, listen, what, what's going on here? Why are, you, why are we here? And as he began to, began to tell me, he said, Pastor Dave, don't, I don't want you to worry. I just want you to follow my lead. Now, that's, I have a little bit of a trust issue. I need to know who I'm with and what the agenda is. I, you know, and, and so, sure enough, Mike said, um, uh, and I, I watched this bus roll in before us, this huge bus, and on the side of the bus was the words, casino. Now, I'm a new pastor in a new district, and now Brother Mike has this bus in front of me, and he's looking at it, and he's getting his seatbelt off, and he's getting ready, and I said, where are you going? He said, you and I are going in that. I said, oh, no, we're, no, we're not. I am not going in a casino bus. There's no way. I mean, I, people know me around here. There's no way. He said, just come with me. And I said, okay, but you better explain this to what's going on. So we get into the bus, and sure enough, for some odd reason, everybody kind of shifted towards the back. Usually they shift towards the front, and, but they shifted more towards the back. There were two or three seats available in the front, and I tell you, I took that first seat I could find. I flipped my collar up, and I was sitting in a corner like this. I thought, the last thing I want is somebody to see me in a casino bus in Niagara Falls going to the casino. Can you imagine the talk? Well, we wouldn't talk, right? No. The talk wouldn't get around. Do you know Pastor Dave was on there? I saw him on a, I did see him on a casino. No, we would never do that. So, worst of it was, we sat down. I thought, okay, well, you know what? I'm sitting down here. Mike obviously has a plan. I'm just going to be very quiet and I'm going to just sit in my little corner here but I forgot that Mike had a gift. And Mike's gift was bringing people together. So there in the, in the casino bus, Mike started to do what Mike did best. He started to, he, he said, hey, what's your name, Frank? What's your name, John? Frank, have you met John? And then they started talking. And then he would get up and walk a little bit further in the bay. Hey, what's your name? And then people were, they were so excited. This was the day they were going to win it big. You ever see people like that? When they get so excited, they're going to the casino and they're happy. And, and then Mike did what I dreaded he would do. He's talking to people and he's knowing them by first name and he's walking the bus and I'm sitting there with my shoulder, my, my suit, and my jacket over my ears and Mike says, hey everybody, let me introduce you to somebody. <laughs> Pastor Dave, stand up. I tell you what, I wanted to crawl down. I, did, I wanted to get as far down as I possibly could. And so I said, <laughs> hi everybody. Now everybody knows I'm Pastor Dave and I'm on a casino bus. <laughs> so now I'm, now I'm starting to get angry. Now I'm, I'm thinking, you know what, in one day, everything I would ever work towards is gone. It's wiped out. I'm on a casino bus. People know about it. It's public news. That's it. How am I going to explain this to anybody? I can see the elders meeting already. Were you or were you not on a casino bus? Yes, I was on a casino bus. <laughs> and so here we are heading towards the casino. Finally, we get, we get into the casino and I say, okay, whoa, 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 brother Mike, whoa, 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 hold on a second here, hold on, hold on. What's going on? What, what, what are we doing here, seriously? I, I'm not going to, I'm not going to be on any, what, what, what are we doing here? He said, Pastor Dave, look me straight into the eye. He said, there are people in this place that are searching for a God they'll never find on a, on a slot machine. He said, they're going to be playing the cards all day today and they'll never find the God they're searching for there. And he said, so can you walk with me and pray over these people? Can we prayer walk the casino? I was humbled. I said, God, whoa, 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 yeah, I'm in, uh, absolutely, I'm in. And so for the next hour and a half, two hours, I don't even know how long it was, we started to walk the casino. We started to, you know, God, I don't know who that woman is over there. I, she looks like she's been there a long time. I, I can't imagine what her life has been like, but you know. God, she's, she's searching for something as she's working that slot machine. I could see the anxiety in her face, and it looks like she doesn't have much of a winning today. God, could, could, you, could you bless her, God? Could you, could you just draw near to her, God? I lift you before the throne, Jesus, and just, just touch her, God. And God, there's a, there's a man over there on the, on the table, on the card table, and man, he looks like, like he's just lost the world. And 
God, you know his needs. You know he's searching for somebody. And for an hour and a half, two hours, we just walked and prayed over people. I, I started to get the picture. People don't need exciting programs. People don't need big agendas in the cities. They need Jesus. I went to our mayor one day. Pastor, I was pastor of a 1,200 member church. <laughs> oh yeah. All the, lar all the pastors of the large churches gathered together and I was one of them. Five large churches in the city of Oshawa and I was one of the king pins. We went to the mayor because we wanted to tell the mayor that we had some, we had some clout in the city. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. We said, Mr. Mayor, you tell us what, we, what you want us to do and we'll do it. We're going to rock this city for Jesus. You tell us what you need us to do. Five of us churches represent over 5,000 people, between five and 7,000 people. You tell us where to jump, we'll jump. You tell us to jump, we'll ask you how high. What do you want us to do for the city, Mr. Mayor? We were waiting for the answer. Our mayor of Oshawa at the time, he just kind of was very soft-spoken and he said, um, he said, pastors, there's a, there's a gentleman that stands in the four corners of Oshawa every single day. And we're like, oh yeah, 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 yeah. They said, he said he wears a gray overcoat and he has a long beard. He's there every single day. And we're like, oh yeah, yeah, but no, no, that's fine, but tell us what you want us to do. Tell us what, what we can do for this city. Tell us how we can, we can shake this city up. And he said, I am, just hang, hang, hang in there with me. He said, there's a man in the city who is wearing a gray overcoat every day. We're like, yeah, we know, we know, we know. Okay, now, but you know what? The, the, this church is in the north. We're in the south and the east. There's one in the south. Well, let, let's rock this city. He's like, I, I hear you, gentlemen. I hear you. But there's a man downtown in a gray overcoat. We're like, seriously? Here's a man in a gray overcoat again. Okay, what? What about the man in the gray overcoat? What's his name? Like, what does that have to do with anything? We want to do, we want to shake the city, uh, Mr. Mayor. We want to do big programs. How can we do it? He said, I, I get that. What's his name? People don't need big programs. People don't need huge events that are going to conquer the world. People just need to know Jesus and and get into a family like this one, just to, that are, they're loved and cared for. I'm so thankful for the family that, that came and, and stood up today and want to be part of your church family. I almost stood up with them. <laughs> I almost said, count me in, I want to be in. I'm here to tell you that there's a lot of different ways to build God's kingdom, amen? amen. We do need programs and structures. We do need them to accomplish our goals because we have God-sized goals that only God can fill. But I want to tell you that when I got to know Brother Mike, I started to learn about loving people one-on-one. -on -one. Just one-on-one. -on -one. Growing God's kingdom one person at a time. Amen? We had a yard sale not too long ago in our home. And uh, when we have a yard sale, it's quite a major event. Um, I like selling things and buying things. Some of you might do that. I don't know if you do. Had a big yard sale and we were selling some, some um, equipment for my computer equipment, some older equipment that I've had, speakers, and I love to collect speakers and things. And, and so I had a, a, some speakers there and had them for a two, two sets. And a young lady came up and she said, uh, I like the music you have playing. I was playing some Christian music at our yard sale. And she said, I like the music you're playing. And I said, oh, well, thank you very much. And she said, are you a Christian? I said, well, I am. I said, are you? She said, yes, I am. And uh, I said, well, I need to be honest with you. I'm a, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist pastor. And she says, well, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. I said, really? Yeah. She says, but I haven't been to church for many, many, many years. And I said, well, let me hear your story. And she started to tell me her story, how she was baptized young, left the church, left, left her homeland, her island, and came, came to Canada and has been living in the area and has left the church, hasn't put a foot in a church ever since. And so I said, you know what, I, I just love your story. I want you to know that every, when you buy this, this speaker system, every time you hear music through it, I want you to remember this conversation. And I want you to know that I'm praying for you. 
I want you to know that, that there's somebody praying for you and that we, you, know, you, are, you are in God's kingdom. You are a child of God and you're valued. And I said, I'd like to pray with you right here. She says, right here? And I said, right here in my yard sale, right here. Is that, is that okay? She says, yeah, that's okay. And so we just started having prayer right there in the yard sale. You see, there are moments that God gives us every day, amen? amen. And sometimes we get so caught up in so many other things, we miss those moments. One moment, I will never, you may never see that person again, that one moment. So we had prayer in that, in that driveway. And I said, God, I want to pray blessing over her that you'll ordain her, bless her children. And God, I know you've got plans for, this, for, for your daughter. I know you've got great plans for her. And we prayed right there in my yard sale. A group of us pastors, we had, we had lunch one day at, at the Mandarin. How many of you like Mandarin? Don't put your hand up. I love Mandarin. I do, as you can tell. I love Mandarin. And so we were there, a bunch of us pastors, and finally there was a gentleman sitting at the far end over there all by himself, and he's sitting there eating his lunch, and, and he hears us pastors, we start talking and chatting, you know. And he, we, we hear, he's, he's hearing what, what's on the agenda and all these great things, and his ears start to perk up, and finally he gets off of his seat, he walks over to us, and he says, hey, by the way, are you guys pastors? And we're like, yes. I was thinking to myself, oh, did we say anything wrong? Did we say anything wrong? Is everything okay? He said, are you guys pastors? And, he's, and we said, yes, we are. He said, well, I'm a pastor too. And he said, well, where, where, what church are you guys from? We said, we're Seventh-day Adventists. He says, wow, man. And he, he didn't even tell us. He's not denominational. He didn't even tell us very clearly what denomination didn't matter right then. And so, you know, we had some light, con light conversation and then he went back to his little table. Us, a bunch of us guys, we started back and talking about our agendas and how we're going to grow the kingdom. And if God impressed me, you go pray with him. And so I got up, I, I left my beautiful, beautifully sculpted ice cream dessert that I had created. I, I left that <laughs> dessert and I walked over to the pastor and I said, I said, listen, I'm just so glad you came to say hello. Is, would you mind if I had a word of prayer for you, with you? And he said, here? I said, yeah, right now. He said, yeah, man, for sure. I'd love for you to pray with me. No one has ever, ever, ever in all my life turned me down. No one has ever said, no, don't, don't you pray for me. No one has ever said that. Atheist, Christian, non-Christian, doesn't matter what religion. No one has ever said, don't pray for me. So I prayed with the man. He said, I want to thank you so much. It's, it's, you don't have no idea the joy it bring to my heart, brings to my heart just to have somebody pray with me today. Thank you for including me in the, in the loop, in the group. I love to bring people before God's throne and lift them up. Amen? Amen? Building God's kingdom one person at a time. So I said to Brother Mike, I said, Mike, what fuels you? Why do you do what you do? Why are you so passionate about God and His people? And he, he, he gave me this verse. He says, you know what? I love Psalm 145. I said, Psalm 145? I was expecting some great, you know, uh, theological, uh, you know, some kind of a uh, uh, foundation. He says, here's my foundation right here, Psalm 145. I want to read this together with you. Can we read this together nice and loud, okay? Can you all see it? Yes. All right, here we go. I will extol you, my God, O King. I will bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you. I will praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. And His greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall praise your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. I will meditate on the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wondrous works. Men shall speak of the might of your awesome acts and I will declare your greatness. They shall utter the memory of your great goodness and shall sing of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and great in mercy. The Lord is good to all and His tender mercies are over all His works. All your works shall praise you, O Lord, and your saints shall bless you. He would stop there. Right about there, you could see his eyes start welling up. He would start and he would reflect on those words. He said, I am on this planet for one solitary purpose, and that is to bless the Lord. Amen. Everywhere I go, everything I do, everything, every person I meet, I want to tell the glory of his splendor. I want to talk about his goodness. I want to praise him for who he is and to bless him. Let's continue reading. They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and talk of your power to make known to the sons of men his mighty acts and the glorious majesty of his kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. Your dominion endures throughout all generations. And he said, Pastor, you need to understand 
God's kingdom is still alive today? I said, yeah, it is. Do you believe that, friends? That God has a kingdom and it's still alive today. God has a kingdom. And so Brother Mike was passionate about the kingdom. He talked about it a lot. The kingdom, the kingdom, the kingdom. I said, well, what, what is all this talk about the kingdom? And you know, just a few years ago, I had the privilege of uh, going to, over to the Holy Lands. Um, there wasn't quite as much strife as there is there now, but uh, we had a chance to go and walk some of the sites. And one of the days we went on the Sea of Galilee. And I began to envision uh, what it was like. Matter of fact, it was, it was an amazing experience because the water got rough. Imagine that. The water got rough on the Sea of Galilee. It was an incredible experience. And so while we were there, um, we walked, uh, we got off the boat, we walked on the side of the, of the seashore there, the Seas of Galilee, and I, I, I remember it was an old wooden boat we were on, uh, bigger than the boat Jesus would have been on, but it was an old wooden boat, and, and there I picked up some shells. I, I, I love to keep those shells mixed into my change, because I, when I reach in for my change once in a while, I, it reminds me of a conversation Jesus had on that very shore. You remember when Jesus was on the shores of Galilee, he talked with Peter and he asked him three questions, or one question, three times. What was the question? Do you love me? And Peter said, yeah, man, yeah, I got you, I love you. He said, no, 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 no. I know you phileo me, I know you love me in humanly love. But his whole agenda was, do you love me in an agape love, amen? And he asked him that three times, and I, right there, a group of us pastors, now you might recognize this pastor, I don't know if you will or not, but... Um, Pastor Moon, we, we, we dedicated our lives to God and knew there. We said, God, you know what? You called many, many people along this seashore and you asked them, if we love you, to feed your sheep. If, if, if we love you, to grow your kingdom. You'll remember the story uh, when Jesus was there with Peter. Do you love me? And if you love me, will you feed my sheep? Don't talk about the love. That's all. Don't talk about it with your lips. Don't, don't just go through the motions. If you love me, I want you to do this one thing. Get to know their names. Get to know them personally and love them and feed them. I can do that, but I want you to be part of this experience. And, and so I started to contemplate there on the shores of Galilee and said, God, you know what? I'm in. If you desire for me to feed your sheep, I'm in. That's Jesus' agenda. Matter of fact, I was thinking about that. What is God's agenda? And here as I looked at this, therefore, let's read it all together, Matthew 28, 19. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands that I have given you, and be sure of this, I am with you always, even in the casino bus, oh sorry, even to the ends of the age. No matter where we go to reach God's people, He is with us, amen? amen. I didn't for one minute feel, feel abandoned going to the casino, I knew He was with us. I knew everywhere we go, He is with us, and His Spirit yearns for us in the souls, souls that we are about to touch. And so I asked the question, what was Jesus' agenda? Open your Bibles, if you will, to Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4. Jesus' agenda is to go and make disciples, to get out there, to grow His kingdom. Now I love this, I love this story. This story, it's actually humorous in some ways. It wouldn't be if I was tempted like he was, but it's actually humorous when you think about it. Matthew chapter 4, if you have your Bibles open to Matthew chapter 4, can you say amen? amen? All right, that was three of you. If you have your Bibles open, how many of you have your Bibles? Lift them up. Amen. Ah, now we're talking, now we're talking. Get ready to go. Matthew chapter 4, the story of the temptation of Jesus. Now I love this story. When Jesus was led by the Spirit, I'm reading from the NIV, into the desert to be tempted by the devil, he fasted how many days? Forty days and forty nights and he was hungry. Then the tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these what? To become what? Now let me ask you something. Whose stones are they? Who owns the stones? Who can turn any stone into bread? And so the devil who is a created being, says to, to, to the creator of all, the owner of all, take your stones and turn your stones into bread. Now, I don't know about you, but that's kind of funny to me. The God, the owner of all, is being told to take his merchandise, his goods, and to transform them. Can God do that? Yes, he can. Well, you know Jesus' response. He says, man, listen. It is written, man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes out of the mouth of God. And then the devil took him to a holy city and stood 
and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. Whose temple is it? Come on now, seriously. The devil has Jesus on his temple and says, now uh, I want to look, look at this for a moment. I have you in the temple. If you are the Son of God, then throw yourself down. First of all, he's on, G on Jesus' turf. It's God's temple. And he says, you know, throw yourself down. And now the devil uses word for word. Jesus used the word. Now the devil uses the word. He will command his angels concerning you and lift you up in his hands so that you will not... Your, so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. And Jesus said, listen, it's also written, don't you dare put the Lord God to a test. And look at that, I love what the devil does. He thinks, okay, well that didn't work. Let's try one more last thing. He takes him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. Now whose kingdom is that? Now I think about that for a moment. Now the devil likes to put his name on that kingdom. The devil wanted to put his stamp on there and say, you know what, this is my kingdom. And now God, I want you to understand, it's my kingdom. In other words, he, he puts God, Jesus, on the highest place he could find and shows him Jesus' backyard. Imagine someone taking you to your backyard and saying, now listen, if, you, if you're just going to bow down to me, I'm going to give you your backyard. Come on. Seriously. Get a life. Devil took him to a very high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you. <laughs> yeah, right, seriously. If you will bow down and worship me. Now, I would have a few choice words, and Jesus, I mean, he had some good ones there too. Jesus said to him, get lost. Get away. Enough is enough. Get out of here. Enough is enough. Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Everything that is to transpire on this planet is about responding back to God and worshiping Him. Amen? Amen. Everything. It's not for our glory. Oh, look at the house I live in. Woo-hoo. Whose house? Oh, look at the car I drive. Woo-hoo. Whose car? You see my shoes I'm wearing? Don't look at my shoes. Whose shoes are they? God's. Everything belongs to Him. That's why this is such a joke, this story. I'm so glad it's here. It's here for a purpose. Don't you tempt the Lord your God and understand there is a dichotomy between two kingdoms, God's kingdom and the kingdom of this world. And Paul reminds us that the God of this world, Satan, blinds the minds of the unbelievers that they, may, they can't see the light of the glory of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We know it's there. He, know, he does that. He blinds the minds. He thinks he is king of this kingdom, but I thank God for when Jesus came, he put an end to that once and for all. There is only one king. There is a battle for the kingdom. For, for the throne, but there is only one king that is rightfully on the throne. I love this. Jesus is tempted. Now, now here's Jesus' agenda. What was it that Jesus went around and taught everywhere he went? Anybody? The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Everywhere he went. Everywhere he went? I came across this powerful, powerful. Uh, this is found again in Matthew. Let's, let's look at this together. Matthew chapter 4, verse 23. Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom, healing every disease and sickness among the people. Everywhere Jesus went, this is what he taught. I love it. He would gather the people together and he would teach about the kingdom of God. Now what was it, what was it he was teaching? The Bible says he was healing the sick. In the kingdom of God, there is no sickness or death or, or sorrow. That's God's, the good news about God's kingdom. He has come to restore all that. Are you, are you done with all of that, friends? Are you done with sorrow, sickness, sadness, and pain? Are you done with that? I am so done with that. Let's get this job done and get home. Wow. And so Jesus, everywhere he went, matter of fact, they said, well, okay, teach us how to pray to God. How do we even pray to God? Listen to the prayer, powerful. Let's read it together. Our Father in heaven. Hallowed be thy name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I love that. And he goes on in chapter 6, reminds us, let's get our priorities straight. Because like the children of Israel, you can get off track real quick. Don't store up things here. By the way, I don't know about here in the Kitchener-Waterloo area, but in, in the Oshawa area, one of the fastest growing businesses in our area are storage units. You guys have them around here? Like they're like little garages and they have orange doors and people just put their junk, uh, their stuff in there. Not junk, right? 
Because we buy stuff and then we don't know what to do with it, so we put it in these storage bins, these storage containers, and then we go out and buy new stuff because now we have room. And when that stuff gets old, we put it in other containers, right? You know what I'm talking about. And so Jesus says, well, wait a minute, don't store up stuff here on this planet. Store up stuff somewhere. Don't store up. Don't worry. Why? Why? Because we are to seek, read it together, seek first the, His kingdom and His righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Pastor, I have a few more minutes, don't I? How long? One o'clock? Can we go to one o'clock? What about 130? I have 130, 130, 125, 125, 125, 130, 135, 130, 140, I have 140, 140, 145. Sorry. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. A little bit longer. Amen? Okay, that's a contract now because you agreed with me in public, so I can't go back now. Okay. Seek first God's kingdom. And so he went on, and there's example after example. Matthew chapter 9, the same thing. He went around teaching the good news of the kingdom. And everywhere he went, I love Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10, he sends the boys out. He's been living with them, walking with them, eating with them, sleeping around the same areas with them. And now he says, you go. Get out on the street. And what was it he told them to preach and teach? As you go, preach this message. Read it together. The kingdom of heaven is near. It is at hand. And of course, we know Matthew chapter 24. This gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to the nations. And then the end will come. So, Jesus came. He lived, he modeled the message, the agenda of the kingdom. By the way, what is the message of the, of the kingdom? The message of the kingdom is that God's authority, as it is in heaven, has now come to this earth. The same authority he has in heaven, as he is king of kings and lord of lords, is now to this earth. He has restored that, that, that authority. He is rightfully the king of, the, of this kingdom. God is king of the kingdom. And so when he comes and preaches and teaches, he lives it and models with authority. They marvel at his authority. And so he dies on an old rugged cross and he's put into a borrowed tomb. And praise God, he rises again. And now the Bible says in Acts chapter 1, he meets together with, for 40 days, he meets together with those early believers. Now, what do you think he talked about for 40 days when he met with them? The weather? What do you think? Kingdom. Listen to this verse, Acts chapter 1, verse 3. And after his suffering, he showed himself to these men, gave very convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days, and he spoke about what? The kingdom of God. For 40 days, he reinforced the value of the kingdom. He reinforced the journey of the kingdom. He reinforced the reality of God's kingdom. I love it. And when you see this transpire, I, I love this. Peter and John, remember the story, they, they healed the crippled man. Now, this is incredible because they received the power of the Holy Spirit. You see, in God's kingdom, God never leaves you alone. God gives you every tool you ever need to accomplish His will. Do you believe that? I tell you what, I started to believe that more and more every day. That's why God's making me bolder every day. I, have, I don't care who I talk to. I don't care what I, where I go and what I do. I, I tell you what, God will empower us to do everything He's called us to do. I hope you believe that. And so here He is. Peter and John, they've experienced the power of the Holy Spirit. They've, they've just been, trans, they've been saying the, the sharing the gospel in different dialects. They, they, they've been speaking a language they've never even spoken of before. They've been witnessing to people they've never even witnessed to before. There's a boldness in the house. And so they see this beggar. And what does the beggar ask for? Money. <laughs> now imagine something. Peter and John have just experienced the, they've experienced the power of the Holy Spirit. They've experienced the teachings of the kingdom of God. And this man wants money. Where is money? Who, what kingdom is money in? Well, there's a kingdom of this world, right? The kingdom of this world, all, it's all they think about is money, 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 money. Amen? All they think about, all we sometimes think about. And so here it is. He's saying, you know what? No, no, I'm not going to talk about that kingdom. Uh-uh, we're not going to talk about that kingdom. In Acts chapter 3, this incredible story. The Bible says they take it by the hand and first he says, you know what, silver and gold we don't have. And you know what, and I would even paraphrase, even if we did have silver and gold, I wouldn't give it to you. I'm going to give you something so much greater than silver or gold could ever accomplish in your life. Get up and walk. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, get up and walk. You see, there's power in the kingdom of God. And so we hear this incredible story. They lifted him up and they helped this, this, this beggar uh, into the temple and then started this incredible series of events. What just happened? 
You see, the rulers and the authorities, they caught on to this message. You see, when God's in the house, people notice, amen? They went around with authority and they started teaching and preaching and healing and they, they, the word started spreading. Hey, isn't that the guy that was sitting at the church all the time in the, in the, in the entranceway? Is, isn't that the guy? He looks a lot like, does he have a brother? No, even, even the clothes, man, he's wearing the exact same thing. It's, but he's walking, how is he walking? You know, how, how did, is, did demons do that? Who did that? How did that, how did that, let's get closer. I'm not getting closer, man. What if he's possessed or something? I'm not getting up there. Imagine the talk that went around. This man who had been beggar for years is now walking into the temple. And so they, they, the word gets out to the authorities. Wait a minute, wait a minute. What's going on here? What's happening? And if you have your Bibles, let's go to Acts. This incredible story. God's kingdom is starting to grow leaps and bounds. And, and with authority now, God's kingdom grows. And we have people that are in, and, and we, we see in the first chapter, second chapter of Acts, how God's people lived in that world, in that environment. Those that have gone before us, how they lived, they ate together, they devoted themselves, they're teaching together. And in this story, they were wondering, how did you guys do this? And so they pulled them in, they pulled the authorities, the authorities pulled them in, and they had to explain how they did this. Now I'm going to fast forward just a little bit in this story. By the way, when the Holy Spirit came and they started preaching in those, in those dialects, how many were baptized in a day? 3,000. And now they're pulled before the authorities, they're asking what's going on. The church, even while they're, in, while, while they're sustained, while they're pulled back in jail, is now growing to 5,000. I love the story. So Peter and John, all this is going on. How is this happening? How did you do this? The priests of chapter 4, the priests and captain of the temple guard and Sadducees, came to Peter and John and they were speak, um, while they were speaking to the people. They seized Peter in verse, verse 3. They seized Peter and John because it was evening and put, put him in jail. While Peter and John are in jail, church grows to 5,000. I love the story. And they asked them, by what power and what name did you, did you do this? Well, Peter with authority... Peter, Mr. I deny you, I deny Jesus three times, decide to get, decides to get bold. And so now, now he's, he's telling the gospel story about Jesus and his agenda and how Jesus, how Jesus was salvation is found in no, no other than Jesus. And he begins to teach them and begins to boldly proclaim the name of Jesus. And they saw the courage, verse 13. They saw the courage of Peter and John and realized, wait a minute, this is not, these are not ordinary men. These are not your average, every ordinary, ordinary people you see walking the streets. Something's going on with these guys. But they were. They were unschooled like you and me. They were ordinary like you and me. But they had something special. What was it? Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit. And so here they are. And they're telling them, you guys, you got to stop teaching in his name. And they're saying, uh, we, we, could if, we would if we could, but we can't. We can't stop doing what we're doing. We, we, we're just, it's just coming out of us. We, and would we rather listen to you or to God? And so they leave this place and now they go after they're being told, I love the story, they've been threatened now by the authorities. They've been threatened by the authorities and now they go to the church. Pastor comes in one day on a Wednesday night and says to you guys, listen, listen, I need to talk to you. The authorities here in Kitchener, they pulled me aside, they came to my house guys, uh, they're just, they're telling us to back off. We're doing so much in this city and, and we're proclaiming the name of Jesus that people are starting to talk. And the authorities came to my house, uh, the leaders of the larger churches, and they said, listen, Seventh-day Adventist Church, shut it up. Stop. Shut it down. What would you say? I live, we live, I believe, in one of the safest countries in the world. I believe that. I believe we've chosen to come to this country for a purpose and I believe that as we have the opportunity to choose, we choose to live in one of the safest neighborhoods, amen? Do you believe that? I tell you what, I have an alarm system in my house that's so sensitive. I turn that alarm system off, the dog wags its tail, guess what, the alarm goes off. Now friends, listen, when I put my children to sleep at night, I have a prayer with them. What do I pray? Lord Jesus, keep us safe. Now if they ever had to say a prayer, that would be the prayer. These guys are being thrown into jail. These guys are being, are, being, are being persecuted left and right. The church is now being persecuted. And they're now at prayer meeting. Let's see what the church prays. Listen to this, friends. Listen. Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with? They're not, they're not telling the, the brethren to shut it down. They're praying to God that God ramps it up. Grant. 
Stretch out your hand. Let them speak with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform your miraculous signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. They just come back from prison. You get the story, right? And so now the story translates. It continues on. They, so they get out there. They're doing their thing. And they say, okay. They're sharing everything together. Check this out. This is incredible. I love this. The Bible says, after the church prayed, they were praying so fervently. That prayer meeting rocked the place. They weren't just praying, Lord, help us bless our meals and our families. Amen, amen, bye. They weren't just going into three-sentence prayers. These, these, these folks were intense in their prayers, intense in their worship, intense in their agenda. And the Bible says in Acts chapter 4, verse 31, the place where they're shaken were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God boldly. Imagine the stories they told. Hey, I was in the market this week, and I heard this, and this happened to me. Wow, well, listen, I was over here, and this, and God did this. And imagine the stories that early church there they were telling. The Bible says that they shared their, their goods. No one in it was needy among them. And if we had time, we'd go through their life story, but we don't have time for that. It's there in Acts chapter 2. The, the incredible life they lived together. But the angel releases them from heaven. And here's, here's an incredible story. More and more women, the Bible says, Acts chapter 5, was brought to the Lord. The high priest and all the associates, they were jealous of what they saw. So they arrest them. They're arrested now and they're put back into prison. Here, here it goes. They're arrested, they're put back into jail, and that night the angel of the Lord comes and opens the doors. Tell me what you would think. Think about it for a moment. You've been put into jail again. The angel of the Lord opens the door. The doors are wide open. What would you do? We're out of here. <laughs> what would you do? Think about it for a moment. Seriously, friends, I have never ever been put into jail. Hallelujah. I've never ever told, been told by anybody, listen man, watch your mouth. You, we don't talk about Jesus here. Never ever been told that. Never been told I can't do what I do when I want to do it. I don't know about you, but I've never been told that ever. There's a freedom in our country to talk about Jesus. There's a window open right now. Amen. And so they're now put into jail again. The, the, the doors are thrown wide open. What does the angel do? Guys, listen, it's been a long day. I know, I know. Go back to your families. You, you know what? You deserve a break. Take a break and just chill for a little bit. We'll, we'll, I'll, I'll be back at you. What does the angel say to the, say to the guys in jail? Get back to work. Come on. The jail gets open. He says, guys, you know where to go. Temple Square. Good going. I'll, I'll get you there. Get back to work. Can you imagine? And the disciples are saying, no, come on. <laughs> I'm not going, man. I'm going to sit right here until I'm not going anywhere. I'm not going. What did the disciples say? Let's go. Let's go, guys. Come on. We got the orders. Let's go. The gates, are, the, the gates are open. And the Bible says they went right back to the temple courts, right back to the place that they were taken before they went into jail, right back to the place. And guess what they were doing? They were preaching and teaching in the name. And here's where the story gets interesting. They don't know what to do with them, the religious leaders. They have no clue what to do with this radical group of people that are filled with the Holy Spirit, preaching in the name of Jesus. And so they start talking one to another. And Gamaliel, you remember the story? The high priest is there. He's a teacher of the law. He's a Pharisee. And, and he says, just, just move, move, move him out of here for a little bit. We've got to think this thing through. And he begins to have this, has this idea. If they're from God, you can't stop them. Don't even think about stopping them. But if they're from man, it's going to die down itself. So don't even worry about it. And so he convinces them. And so the Bible in a very few short sentences has this summary. It says in Acts, Acts chapter 5 and verse 40. It says, His speech persuaded them. They called the apostles in and had them flogged. By the way, what's flogging? Have any of you ever been flogged? I've never been flogged. Flogging is where they take strips, sometimes of chain or of leather, huh? Metal. And at the end of those strips, they put glass or metal. And then they, 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 they whip. They whip the individual how many times? Th why 39? 40 less 1. 39, thank you. Because 40 will take them out. 40 will kill them. 
And so in this short little sentence here in the book of Acts, it says, you know what? His speech persuaded them. They had them, all the apostles brought in and had them flogged. And friends, I've got to be honest with you, for so many years, I glanced over this verse like, oh, okay, that's nice. Next verse. And then in the next days, Jesus had a number of disciples. I said, wait, 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 wait a minute. Hold on. Had them flogged. Think about that for a moment. How did they do it? Two by two? I don't know. I don't know how they did it. Maybe they had, they were, they had two or one up at the post. I don't know. I've never seen anybody that was punished that way. I've never seen anybody. And so when God started to impress me, He said, no, I want you to understand, these are the people, these are the ones that went before you. These are the ones that, that took the kingdom message with full heart, full soul, full strength, took it out to the people. This is the life they live. Let's talk about this for a minute, Dave. And if you're standing in line and you're watching your fellow brother or sister being flogged, let's talk about that for a minute, Dave. What about one? What about that first stripe? What would it do to you, Dave? What about number two? What about number three? What about number 37 when you can't even see their body moving, when you can't even see that breath, if they're even willing, able to take a breath? And you know that when they hit 39, you know, Dave, when they hit number 39, they're going to be calling your name. Tell me about that, Dave. What are you going to do? Are you going to walk? Or are you going to stand there and say, bring it on? In the name of Jesus, you bring this on. From the, I will not move from this place. Where will you stand? You see, that's what, these, that's what the church before us, those that handed the baton to us, that's the life they lived. They said, you know what? If that's where I've got to go for the kingdom of God, then bring it on. Let's go. Life or death, we're moving on. And so the Bible says they had them flogged. And I can't even imagine what that was like. And then the story takes a twist that is beyond my thinking, friends. I've got to be honest with you. The Bible says here now in, in Acts chapter 5, verse 41, that the apostles left the Sanhedrin fed up. No? Now how is that possible? Come on now. And here's the part that started to, God started to speak to my heart. Here's the part. They left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they had been counted worthy to suffer disgrace for the name. You see, not everybody gets to suffer disgrace, but they were counted worthy. And so I think about this kingdom agenda. God chose ordinary, unschooled, ordinary people like you and I. And He, he handpicked them, He chose them, and they received the power of the Holy Spirit. And they were unstoppable. And oh, I love the story. The Bible says they just rejoiced. They just kept going. And then, look at this guy. What, is he, what does he look like to you? Don't answer that question. We live in a society where we don't have people pointing their fingers at us too often, like I said. They did, and they still moved the agenda forward. I love it. And we can read in Acts chapter 8 where Philip goes along. Philip is now preaching the word of the kingdom about the kingdom of God. We can now go forward in Acts chapter 19, verse 2. We can see where Paul entered the synagogue. He was talking about the kingdom of God. We Acts chapter 28, we can see where Paul on a certain day came in a certain large number of people. From morning until evening, he explained, declared to them about the kingdom of God. We could go on and on and on. Acts chapter 28, verse 30, same thing. Paul, for two whole years, he stayed there and he preached about the kingdom of God. We could even go now to... You know what, I'm going to take you to Germany. Can we go there for a few minutes as we close? Went to Germany last year. Dr. Uh, Don Schneider, Elder Don Schneider and Marty Schneider, they took us, took us, and took us a tour on, a re on the Reformation tour. And I, I, I loved his theme. You know, we were learning about the, the reformers, the kingdom builders, and those that had gone before us. And he took us to Hitler's bunker. Have any of you ever been to Hitler's bunker in Germany? Wow, I tell you what, man. I, I, I know four words in German, but now I know 40. You know, Schwinghammer, it's a German word, and all that German language started coming back. It was a great experience. And so, Do Elder Schneider told us the next morning we were going to Hitler's bunker. This is the place where he and his girlfriend, where Ava, where, where they actually they were married, and, and towards the end of the war, um, um, they decided to take steps. To actually, they had committed suicide. You see, Hitler didn't want his body, didn't want his body paraded around when the war was over that he lost. So he said, you know, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna take this step together, and then we want our bodies burned. Do not let them parade our bodies. You see, there was a man who had a vision for an earthly kingdom. A man who almost had the, the world in his hands, who took it as far as he could possibly take it to build an earthly kingdom. And God says, you don't understand, I, this is my kingdom. 
And so Elder Schneider was going to take us to Hitler's bunker. I said, man, I want to see this place. I want to see where Hitler, that was the last place that he, I mean, last place on, on earth. And so uh, Elder Schneider, you know, he took a chair with him every now and then. He would sit down. And he sit by this, by this bush here. He took us by this bush uh, in Berlin and, and he sat down and I thought, okay, he's going to tell us a story now before we go in. And he said, I want you to look around here for a minute. I want you to look around to this place and I want you to see. What do you see? And we said, well, we see weeds, we see a few bushes. And we're like, where's the bunker? Let's go to the bunker. He said, you know, usually when there's a grand event, there's a monument. Usually when people go, they're selling, they're selling cards, they're selling t-shirts, they're selling all kinds of stuff. But what do you see? We saw nothing. He said, underneath where we stand is Hitler's bunker. Many people on this planet try to build earthly kingdoms. And I thank God he steps in, God steps in. There's no monument to tell the story. There's no monument celebrating the works of Hitler that he did there. Well, I shouldn't say that, there are, mon there are monuments. We went to the next one. The memorial of all the murdered Jews. It was a terrible, terrible testimony of that era of history that nobody's proud of. And so we, 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 saw, we, we saw the devastation of those that try and build their earthly kingdoms. And there was no money, but however, we went throughout Europe and we did see monuments there. It was powerful. Monuments of a, of a man by the name of Martin Luther. You've heard of his name before, huh? That reformer who, who decided to say, no, 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 some of these things are wrong. Matter of fact, there's 95 of these theses, of these issues that I have a problem with. And so we, we, went, we went to take a look at some of the things Martin Luther did when, when he said, you know what? I will make a commitment that I will become a monk. God, if you'll have me, I'll become a monk. If you'll sustain me. And God did. I'd love to tell you the story sometime. Finished his, his master's degree in Erfurt. And matter of fact, we went there. I, I stood at the place where, where Luther began to, his journey um, with the Lord and began his journey in studying and preparation there in Erfurt. I stood at the place where he, had his first, he did his first communion. Walked the halls where Luther walked in that little tiny, little tiny room where, where God began to speak to him and inspire him through the word. He went to a place called Wittenberg and he was sent there to minister in a place called Wittenberg. God said, I want you, he was in, in, by, by those above him, he was commanded, he was, he was destined to go there, he was told to go there. He didn't want to go there. Do you know there was 400 homes in Wittenberg at the time and over 200 of them had licensed distilleries in them. Imagine you could go to a place like that where everybody had license to brew. <laughs> Not coffee or anything like that, this is brewing beer. <laughs> And there they were, and he was sent to this place, and he knew the challenges that were there in the surrounding. He had to oversee 11 monasteries, work for the good of the priesthood, pe uh, preach, pastor the town church, teach at the university. And he taught there. Um, in 1508, he taught one semester at the Wittenberg University. God had a plan for him. October 31, 1517. By the way, the 500-year anniversary is just around the corner next year. We went there in Wittenberg and we saw the door frame there, where the, the door frame where he nailed those 95 theses. When a coin in the coffer rings, a soul from purgatory springs. You saw there are, there are people that have claimed to have authority on God's kingdom. God says, whoa, 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 don't you dare distort my kingdom. Don't you say that, that you've got to pay your way to, to have eternity. You don't have to do that, you know. And Luther said, this is wrong. And he nailed it to the, he stood up against all odds. He knew what the cost would be. He knew what the cost would be. At that time of the Reformation, they took him to Warburg Castle where he began in a small little room, small tiny little room. There was this beautiful, gorgeous castle, but no, in a small tiny room, he chose to translate the, the Bible into German and, and unite that language as never before. God used the Luther Bible to unite the language, the different dialects of the German language. Incredible story. But I don't want to just tell you about that. I could tell you about his wife who was an incredible kingdom builder. I want to move on. We only have just a few short seconds left. Let's go on. We ended our journey in Eisleben. Eisleben was the last place. He was born, Luther was born in Eisleben, but he also died there. He was preaching his last sermon in St. Anne's Church. Um, incredible, his sermon was incredible sermon. His last sermon was on Matthew chapter 11, verse 25 and verse 30. Chapter 11, verse 25 and 30. Come to me all who are weary and burdened. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me and I am gentle and humble in heart. You'll find rest for my souls for my yoke is easy. And as he was preaching his message, he just... He started to, he was very weak, very faint. And he said those words, I just can't go on, guys. I can't go on. And they took him across the street to a home he was staying. Now it's called the death house of the place where Luther died. And he prayed this final prayer. I don't know if you can read it very clearly there, but I'm going to read it to you. This is what he said. 
O my heavenly Father, alone God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, you God of all our consolation, I thank you for revealing to me your dear Son, Jesus Christ, in whom I believe whom I have preached and confessed, whom I loved and praised, yet whom the shameful Pope and all goodness revile, persecute and scorn. I pray you, Lord Jesus Christ, take pity on my little soul, O Heavenly Father, if I must now leave this body and be torn away from this life, I now, I know for sure that I shall live with you forever and ever, that no one can tear me away from your hands. Amen. Amen. He prayed his prayer. He prayed this prayer. And then he would recite, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. For God so loved the world. Three times he said that prayer. And at 3 a.m. in the morning, the reformer died. Imagine the last words of your breath being, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. And so I love these stories of those that have gone before us, those kingdom builders that have gone before us. I love to hear their stories. And there is monuments all over Europe of this man and, and how God used him. God can use anybody and everybody. I wish we had time to go through them all, but we don't. We ended our journey in, the, in Dachau, concentration camp. And there we learned of a pastor. His name of pastor is Pastor Nye Mueller. Pastor Nye Mueller was in cell 30. We stood there for a little while in cell 30. And, pa and Elder Schneider began to tell us the story. You see, there was a time in Hitler's regime where he would have the churches and the leaders pray in the name of the people, in the leader, in the fatherland. They couldn't pray in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And, and and Pastor Neimuller decided, you know what, I will not bow down to the wishes of, of our country. And so he was sent to this prison camp. He was there for a long extended period of time. And he was visited by pastors. Pastors would say, listen, Pastor, what are you doing here? And he would say, what am I doing here? Why aren't you here? Why aren't you here? And so I look to this, friends. These kingdom builders that have gone before us, that have stood the test of time, that have stood strong, what about you? If there was ever a monument to be stood, to be commemorated for you, what would it say? Younger generation of all ages, what would it say about your journey with God? Would we be talking about it at some point and saying, you know what, that woman, that man, they stood up for the kingdom. They were all in to God's agenda, God's kingdom agenda, growing the kingdom. Is that what they would say? What would they say? You know, I, I, I like this picture. You've probably seen this picture before. I, I, I use it quite regularly. By the way, the little, little guy with the full head of hair, that's me. That's my parents and my sister. You can't really see it in that picture, but they're leaning against a 1969 Oldsmobile. This big old 19-foot boat. I used to love that Oldsmobile as a little boy. It had a 455 rocket engine, and when Dad put the pedal to the metal, that thing would roar. <laughs> it was awesome. I remember sitting in the back seat like, whoa, here we go. And it would lean like this. And the front end would lift and bow, it would go amazing. <laughs> and I said to myself, if I ever get a car, that's the car I want. I want that thing. I just, it was white, that's it there. It was a gorgeous car, long thing. But you know what? That car isn't around anymore today. It ended up in some wreck or some yard somewhere. And it's not, it's not the way it used to be. Because things on this planet, God reminds us, will rust and decay. So what are we doing putting all our energy and focus and time into the things of this world? Because that's where they end up. Matter of fact, even the company Oldsmobile, remember that slogan, it's not your father's Oldsmobile anymore? They tried desperately to bring that Oldsmobile line back. It's not around anymore. Well, I could go on to tell you, I want, to, I want to bring this one point. We are in a time of our journey. Those that we've talked about today that went before us, they've come and gone. Now you and I have been given this kingdom agenda. And when I started reading about this kingdom agenda and it started, it just hit me. It hit me hard. And so we look at the world around us. We look at the agenda of the world around us. Do you know right now there are 1 .8, over 1.8 million nonprofits that have their hand out? By the way, maybe you've even had them calling to your home. Maybe they're coming to your house. Maybe they're, maybe they're you know, they're, they're at, and they're all good. But there are hands out for our means, our money. As never before, at any century before, it has never been like this before. And do you know what people say about God's church? All they do is talk about 
money. Do you know the least place money is talked about in our generation? Is the church. We don't talk about it because we know when we talk about money, it's going to hurt a little bit. But I'm here to close this sermon and I want to talk about money just for two seconds. When we think of God's kingdom agenda, I think about how this is going to be accomplished. If we keep doing what we're doing, friends, it's not going to happen. If you and I keep doing what we're doing and living the lifestyles that we're living, God's kingdom, His agenda will be suffering. I went to a church not long ago. The trim on the doors was falling off. I walked into the gymnasium and all the pieces on the wall were just hanging off the wall. You see, I have a problem, friends, when God's house looks worse than the house you and I live in. Amen? And so I think about this so much. I think about this whole experience so much and I think, how are we going to get this kingdom agenda done? Well, Pastor, God's going to have to finish it. You know what? Yeah, He will have to finish it. And those that went before us, they gave everything and everything, anything and everything to the agenda of God. And you know what? Here's where it gets uncomfortable. Put your seatbelts on. We're going to squirm a little bit together. Amen? Can we do that? Can you still love me? I know, I know it's going to hurt just a little bit. If we don't say enough is enough, then the next generation is going to have to take it on. I read God's scripture and I read about rocks that will cry out His praise. I said, I will not be outpraised by a rock. I will not be outclapped by a tree. Hello. And God says, you know what? All of them, all of them will give me praise. But now what about the kingdom agenda? I will not let the next generation carry the burden of the kingdom agenda because I wanted to live in a nice house. I wanted to drive a nice car. I wanted to have all those things that this earthly kingdom cherishes. I want to be known as somebody who stood up for the kingdom of God. What about you? Somebody who sacrificed. I was a pastor of a church. People took second and third and fourth mortgages. The builder generation, they weren't scared of going the distance. But my generation, oh my God, forgive us. My generation, we gladly took the keys. We said, thank you very much. And guess what we did? We never maintained the buildings. We never grew them and built them and like they did. We never did that. We just used them. And now my generation is saying, well, how are we going to fix this? Who's going to pay for all this? I just bought a 70-inch screen TV. How am I going to pay for this? I can't pay for this. I'm here to tell you, friends, that God is speaking to my heart. That's all I'm saying. Nothing wrong with having a 70-inch screen TV. Nothing wrong. But what about God's agenda? What about God's agenda? How are we going to accomplish God's agenda in this generation? No more excuses. We own it. It's ours. It's been given to us. We own this agenda. God's agenda is now our agenda. Can I hear an amen? I don't want to hear you to go, oh, amen. No, 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 no. This is good news, friends. This is good news. What we can't do, God will do for us. No question. God will never send us somewhere without giving us all the tools. Amen? God will give us everything we need to accomplish His agenda. I hope you believe that. If I didn't believe that, I wouldn't be standing here. I would not be standing here at 20 after 1. Wow. Okay, we're done. So here's what we do. God says 10%. 10% is mine. Don't touch it. You got that, right? God didn't ask for 20%, didn't ask for 40%. 10% is His. Every penny you have, every dollar you have, 10 cents, of that dollar goes to Him. That's non-negotiable. Let me talk about the rest. Then we say to God, I want to say thank you to you. How do we do that? I want to give at least 3 to 5%. This is, what the, this is what the church in North America has voted. That all of us together, all of us together will give 3 to 5% to our local church, 1 to 2% to our conference, and finally, not finally, not last, least but not last, 1 to 3% for the world. There are people in our conference that have committed to God and said, you know what, I'm in. Whatever it's going to take to grow this kingdom, I am in. And guess what, we can do this together. Guess how? Here's how. I love going to Tim Hortons. I'm not on camera, am I? Is the camera rolling? It's rolling. Okay, I'm just kidding. I love getting teas at Tim Hortons. And you know what I do? I drive by, I love to, when I drive to my different churches, I love to get a tea. And so God finally convinced me. He says, Dave, look at that tea. And I said, okay, I'm looking at it. He said, no, no, think about it for a moment. I spend $1.50 on that tea maybe three or four times a week. Did you know that? You didn't know that. 
Now you know. A dollar fifty every time I go through the drive-through. And I thought to myself, God, wait a minute, how much am I spending a year on tea? I did the math, $390. I said, God, you know what? I'm going to give up my tea for one year. I'll give $390 for your kingdom's sake. Yes. <laughs> now, you know what? What am I going to do with $390? Maybe buy a, f a couple pads for the pews? Maybe buy a couple extra hymnals? What am I going to do with $390? Nothing. Bang, the, the idea hit me. If one out of three Seventh-day Adventists in Ontario, we have 30,000 of us, if one out of three decided to give up their teas for one year, guess how much we could raise? $3.9 million. Bang! Done. Just by giving up a tea. By giving up that little something extra. We say, you know what, I'm going to give up a little bit because God, God's worth it. And so I want to I leave you with this thought. What can you and I do together to say, you know what, God, I've been enjoying this life you've blessed me with, but I want to get the job done so we can go home. What can you and I do? Well, we talk about kingdom builders. That's why you see signs everywhere. But you've been reading in the highlights. What's it all about? Let me, give you, let me give you the summary. Kingdom builders, number one. We believe that the church cannot grow to its potential unless you and I partner together with God to see the mission go forward, not only in Kitchener, and not only in Waterloo, but in this entire province of Ontario. Do you believe me? We have people around this province that are so locally minded. But when we put our funds together, our means together. Now maybe some of you are saying, Pastor, I'm so poor I can't do anything. Well, hold on a minute. Maybe you're cash poor but asset rich. Maybe there's a way that the land you own, the property you own, maybe there's a lot of different ways God may speak to you. And so what about this? We believe evangelism and, and, and church growth has to happen. Christian education. We want more and more of our kids to experience Christian education. So we're going around this province and we're asking people to consider partnering with God to put as many kids through Christian education as possible. Next one. Church and school buildings. We would love as a conference to be able to say, Kitchener, you guys doing renovations? Here's a check. Tell us how much you need. Here's a check. Do you know why? Because members all across Ontario are partnering with God in this initiative. And so churches can build additions and build, and build satellite areas and build, we can go into new un, unentered territories. Property development, we have a, we're considering a multi-purpose uh, camp meeting facility um, there in the Oshawa area. Community services and disaster response. By the way, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. When someone's hungry, they not even want to necessarily even hear what you have to say. Give them a loaf of bread, different story. Give them something that fills their stomach, different story. We'd love to have five community centers all throughout this province. You know, it's $1.7 million per community center. Pastor, you're dreaming. How are we ever going to accomplish this? Are you kidding me? I'm dreaming? The God I serve owns the cattle on a thousand hills. Someone says to me, I'm dreaming. No, 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 no. I'm dreaming too small. My God is bigger than this. Amen? Amen. I tell you what, God's going to get it done with or without us. I want to be part of that. Have any of you been to Camp Friendly lately? You know, our buildings collapsed. You know that, right? We're getting them rebuilt. Thank the good Lord for insurance. But there are lives being changed every single year at our camp. There are young people giving their hearts to Jesus every single year. God has blessed us and blessed us. We want to see more come to the kingdom at that place. And so we have this dream, kingdom builders, that when God's people say, okay, you know what, I don't really need this. You know what, I, I can do away with this. I can partner with this. I presented this to our staff one morning in our worship. We have secretaries in our office that are giving $70, $80, $100 a paycheck a month towards a Kingdom Builder project. People are all over this province like you and I are saying, you know what, I'm in. I can do this. We have people selling properties and giving in. We have, we have people calling me one day on the 401. Hey, Pastor Dave, what's happening at Camp Frenda? Uh, what do you mean? Well, what's the pro what are you building there? We're building an outdoor chapel so people can come, young people can come and experience Jesus in nature. Well, what, what, are you, what are you looking at? He said, well, it's going to cost X amount of dollars. Well, can you use $10,000? I said, whoa, I got to pull over for this one. Hold on a minute. <laughs> so I pulled over. I listened to his heart. He said, I was there as a young boy. I, I, I got to know Jesus at Camp Frienda. Can I start by giving $10,000? And now, you know what? I, I own a construction company and I have engineers. Can we design the building? And once it's designed, you know what? I, I've got people that will fundraise for you. We can probably even finish it for you. Let me tell you something. God has people everywhere, even sitting here. But pastor, my dollar won't do much. Yeah, maybe your dollar won't do much. Put us all together and together we can. Yes, we can. All right. You have been so gracious. You've been amazing. I have put you through so much torture today. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I may never be called back. This is my last chance. 
<laughs> friends. <laughs> keep going, keep going. No, no. no. Oh, friends. I want to tell you, I hope you know how much I love you. I hope you realize the passion I have for God's church. And I am not there. I am so not there yet. God's teaching me every single day. So there's ways that God will talk to you. I do have a story I could close with that happened here, but I probably don't want to tell it because we're late, right? No. Oh, you want me to tell it? Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Well, then if you want me to, t if you want me to tell it, I was going to close and let you go, but I guess now that you want me to tell it, I might as well tell it. <laughs> I might as well tell it. You may even remember this story. I couldn't remember if I told it here last time I was here. Did I tell the story about my guitar? Did I? Remember the story? No. Not the one million dollars. That's another story. I can tell that one too. Okay, I you remember the story of the guitar? How many of you remember the story of my guitar? Happened here. We have one? Okay, just plug your ears. It's okay. You'll hear it again. I hope the version you heard the first time is the same one you're going to hear now because it's like my fish story. It gets bigger every time. I became stewardship director of the Ontario Conference and God began to, began to impress my heart. You're going to go out and teach stewardship. I want you to sell your guitar. I said, well, that's not going to happen. <laughs> You don't understand, God gave me, a, for me, a very expensive guitar. And, and I, when I got the guitar, I thought I would never be able to afford that kind of a guitar, but God worked out in a way that I could buy the guitar. And now I'm becoming stewardship director and God is impressing me to sell the guitar. And first I thought, you know what, this is it. Wow, where'd that come from? That should never be in my head. But it wouldn't go away, it wouldn't go away, it wouldn't go away. And finally I told my wife, I said, I said Ingrid, listen, I got this feeling in my head, you know what? Like, Excuse me, I think that I sense that God is telling me to sell, sell my guitar. And she's like, well, sell it. I'm like, no, 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 no. That's not what I want to hear. You know, she's like, what's the problem? Then sell it. If he's telling you, sell it, sell it. I said, no, no, no. I said, you don't understand. It took me so long to get this guitar. And every, every time I, now here's the problem. Every time I would stand up in front of people, you know, I'd play that guitar. Afterwards, people would come and say, whoa, Pastor Dave, man, that's a nice guitar. I'm like, oh, yeah, dude. Want to touch it? Oh, yeah. Just t don't touch it long. Just touch it a little bit. Oh, oh, oh. A little too close, back up. Okay, just to touch it, you know? And, and, and it, became, it became my, whoa, check out the guitar Pastor Dave's playing. God said, sell it. I'm like, oh. Okay, so I said, I'm going to do this. And you remember the story. Some of you might remember the story. I put it on Kijiji just for a short period of time. Put it on Kijiji. You know what Kijiji is, right? Online. online uh, anyway, I put it on Kijiji for the first week. A lot of people calling, a lot of people responding on email. Uh, bought the guitar. Guess what? First week came, first week left, nobody bought the guitar. I'm like, hallelujah, we're done, right? That's it? God's like, no, 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 keep it there. I'm like, oh, seriously. So remember, this, I'll fast forward the story. Second week, third week, fourth week, this same impression, keep the guitar for sale, keep the guitar for sale. All the while, one guy, one guy is, 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 is constantly come, emailing me back, is your guitar still for sale? I'm like, dude, the guitar is still for sale. Come and look at it. I mean, it's no, it's no br big deal, right? Fourth week, fifth week, sixth week, nobody's looking at my, I'm like at page 900 in Kijiji, and this one guy, hey, your guitar's still for sale? I'm like, seriously, who is this guy, right? He's not letting go of this thing. And so, I finally say, you know what? He emails me on a, uh, uh, on a Friday, and he says, is your guitar still for sale? This is week six, five or six, can't remember, it's all foggy now. And he says, I'm gonna come, I live in London, Ontario, I'm gonna come to Woodstock, look at a guitar, if I don't buy that one, I'm gonna to go to Toronto, look at a guitar, if I don't buy that one, I'm gonna to go to Oshawa and look at your guitar. On a Sunday, I'm like, cool, let's get this thing over with. Sunday comes and goes, nobody comes. I'm like, hallelujah, we're done. God says, leave the guitar. <laughs> I left the guitar on Kijiji, same guy. Hey, is your guitar still for sale? I'm like, seriously, dude, <laughs> seriously. So I said, okay, uh-huh. I said, I'm going to Kitchener, Ontario to do a series of meetings. Remember, I hung out with you guys for one week. Yeah. Yeah. Two people remember. Okay, I wasn't that, that dynamic. Okay. I said to the guy, I'm coming to Kitchener to do a series of meetings. We're going to meet at, where was I? I was at, the, help me with the story. Where was it? I was at the hotel here in Kitchener. I can't remember the name of the hotel. Thank you. Was it Holiday Inn? You paid for it. How much, where was it? I can't remember. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, you didn't. I paid for it. Just saying. Okay, anyway. <laughs> So I'm at the hotel and I say to the guy, listen, I'm going to be at this hotel on a Thursday evening at 9 o'clock. You be there. We're going to finish this thing once and for all. All right. 9 o'clock, Thursday. And the door knock. I open the door. Hi, Pastor Dave. 
what is it God wants you to tell me? I said, dude, are you here for the guitar? Like, <laughs> are you the guitar guy? He says, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Pastor Dave, huh? What is it God wants you to tell me? I said, man, you, <laughs> you better come in. You, <laughs> there's a lot of gaps in your story. I need to ask a lot of questions here. So he tells me the story. He says, well, you know, your email address is Pastor Dave at collegeparkchurch.ca. And in the second or third email into the story, into the journey, I told him, I says, you know what, I, I, I play the guitar once in a while at church in wor leading worship. And bang, the lights went on. Pastor Dave, oh, okay, at College Park Church, maybe, maybe if I Google his name, Google the church, maybe if I can find their website and, and see what's there, maybe if by chance there's even a sermon archive, maybe I can see the guitar while he's playing it. So for seven weeks, this man had been listening to every sermon, watching every sermon we posted on that website. And so he knocks on there and he says, Pastor Dave, what is it God wants you to tell me? He's like, Pastor Dave, what are you Adventists, man? Who are you people? You guys really love Jesus, don't you? And I say, yeah, we do. And I started talking to him about empowered living and about life in the kingdom of God. And all these things. He was from a United Church, just came back to the Lord after a few years. And I got to witness to him for over an hour and a half about the love of Jesus and who God is. And then the lights went on. Could I have met this man at nine o'clock in a hotel room? If I would have said to God, no, 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 God. No, 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 this is my guitar. No, no, I'm sorry. I'm not selling this guitar. No. You see, it's God's guitar. And if he wants to lead someone to Jesus in a deeper walk with him, he'll do it any way he wants to. He'll do it with your car. He'll do it with your suitcase. He'll do it with your lawn ornaments. He'll do it with whatever you want to use. Whatever he wants to use, he's going to use it. The challenge is, he's going to come to you where it hurts the most. He's going to say, hey, by the way, can I borrow that just for a few days? And we're going to say, Lord, no, 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 there's some over there. They're over there. Don't, don't take mine. Don't touch mine, God. That's mine. Like, just back off, you know? God owns everything. And so the lights went on, friends. And so there he is playing my guitar. I'm like, okay, that's cool. That's fine if it goes. That's no problem. Anyway, long story short, we get on our knees and we start praying. He says, uh, Pastor Dave, um, <clears throat> I get up off our prayer. We had a beautiful prayer together. And he pulls out this wad of money. Wad of money. And he says, everything you ask for, Pastor Dave, I've got here. And of all the guitars I've tried, this is the one. But I'm not going to buy it. I'm like, oh, yes, you are. <laughs> I did not go through this. And you're not going to buy You're going to buy this guitar. He says, no, I'm not. While we were praying, God impressed me. I'm not going to buy the guitar. And he didn't buy the guitar. I met the brother. We're, we're brothers in Christ. And uh, I know I'll see him again. I know our paths will cross again. He walked out of there not selling the guitar. But guess what God did? God took the need for me having to have it away from my heart. I don't have to play that guitar anymore. I left it on Kijiji. The next week, bang, it was gone. Somebody bought it. But this is the part of the story I didn't tell you. I have no guitar now, it's gone. So I said, God, you know what, it's cool. If I have some sticks, I'll, I'll, I'll bless you. If I have, if I have a little, a little uh, Walmart keyboard, I'll bless you. Whatever it's gonna take, I'll bless you. And so here's what he did. There was an ad on Kijiji for a guitar. I saw the ad and it had one zero missing. I looked like it. It was only $300. Same brand, similar brand, different model. And I said, how is that possible that that guitar could be for $300? I called the guy and I said, listen, is your guitar still for sale? And he says, uh, yeah. He says, you know what? Um, I've had the guitar for sale for weeks and no one's even come to look at it. I said, well, where are you? He lived like a block away from me, a couple blocks away. I went to look at the guitar and I couldn't believe what I saw. An absolute beautiful guitar. It was a limited edition, same make as the one I had, different model. Limited edition. Somebody had put a hole in the side on the top of it. He was selling it for parts. It played beautiful. So I bought that guitar as quickly as I could. I got it home and find out that it was a guitar called a Maranatha guitar. Maranatha guitar was built by this manufacturer for just built 500 of them for worship leaders. These larger churches got together and they, they talked to the manufacturer and they said, listen, is there a chance that you could build a guitar for those in our churches leading worship? And they custom built these 500 guitars for worship, leader, for worship leaders and I have one of them. But the problem is there was a big hole in the top. Now what am I going to do? I didn't know what to do. So I played it that way for the longest time. I played it that way. My wife finally said, Dave, if you're going to play this guitar, seriously, you're going in front of people. Why do you want to have a hole in there? Send it back to the manufacturer. I said, okay, it might cost us some money. She just send it back to the manufacturer. 
Listen to the story, friends. I sent the guitar back to California to the manufacturer. That guitar was built in 2003. And so I said, I'm, I'm, willing to, I'm willing to play this guitar just the way it is. A week later, the manufacturer calls me. Mr. Schwinghammer, your guitar is here for repair. I'm like, yes. And uh, we'd like to, to ask you a question. Okay. We have taken the top off of your guitar to repair it, but somewhere along the line, we've noticed the specifications aren't quite the way we'd like them to be. Mr. Schwinghammer, would you mind if we built you a brand new guitar. <laughs> I'm like, no, no, I want that guitar. No, I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Tell me something. Who put the seed in the ground for that tree to grow? Who watched that tree grow to make the wood for that guitar? Who was there when, when those guys took that and handcrafted that guitar and put it together? Who owns that guitar? God does. And some of us stress and fret about how we're going to do the next great thing and how we're going to have the next great thing. God is saying, seek ye first the kingdom of God and all these things will be given unto you. Amen. So now I own a one-off, already a, a, a limited edition guitar. They built me a brand, they brought all the old molds out again. They built me a brand new guitar, a reproduction of that, of that, of that special edition guitar. I say, God, you are so good. On the top of that guitar is a Holy Spirit dove. And the dove goes right, it's ingrained in the, in the neck. There are doves all the way down representing the Holy Spirit. And I say, God, to you be the glory. Amen. Somebody came to me after I told the story. They said, Pastor Dave, I think God is saying you should give me that guitar. I said, no, he didn't. <laughs> oh, no, he didn't. <laughs> I says, once he tells me, then I'll give it to you. But until he does, it's my guitar. <laughs> Friends, I'm, I'm so over time and I apologize a million times, but I just want to say this. God invites you to partner with Him and nothing is impossible. Amen. Expect the best because we serve the best. Amen. I hope you believe that because this closing song is going to hurt a little bit. <gasps> closing song. Let's do this. All right. Let's do this. Let's get it over with. Team, come on.